components of truth, okay? I broke it down into three categories uh, where we can ask questions. And uh, uh, the first is vertical, okay? What's the, what's the basis for this information? What am I standing on? Okay, okay, I'm standing on a floor, and this is supported by beams that are going underneath here, which are supported by the walls, which is supported by a foundation that probably goes 20 feet into the earth or more. Okay, so I feel pretty good on this surface, okay? Ask the same kinds of questions. Where do, how, what's the support for this information? What's the evidence? What are the assumptions that it's based on? Uh, what are the sources? What's the reasoning behind it? Okay, there's a whole sequence of questions that we can, we can draw out of that. And then looking at the horizontal. What's the context? What's the history? Okay, what are the implications? Um, what's, what are other ways of looking at it? How do other people see it? And to the extent that we take that into account, we can discern the truth. Okay? And then the third, and actually I'm suggesting to start with this one um, in the next slide, um, is heart. What does it do to our relationships? What does it do to our sense of self and who we are? And you can boil that down to one question. And if I were to ask one question about uh, any news source that I'm reading, it would be this one. The first question to start with, I would suggest, is, is it divisive? If it's divisive, turn it off, shut it down, look somewhere else. It's not helpful. People put out divisive information in order to gain power over us. And now a journalist will want to gain power over us because they want us to go back to their article and to, for us to reinforce their views. So I'll mention two journalists, uh, Paul Krugman and um, Will, I don't want to say James Will, but it's not, George. it's George Will, yeah, George Will. Uh, they're opposite end of the spectrums, both of them are brilliant men, okay? Paul Krugman is a, is a Nobel Prize econo economist, okay? Both of them are incredibly divisive, okay? They never look at the other perspective. They write creative, very creative, uh, well-written articles, you would probably appreciate it as a writing instructor, okay? <laughs> of, of, you know, how they communicate that. Um, but it's divisive. And if I ever met either one of them, I'd say, I never read any of your stuff because it's divisive. And what is our world about? It's about, we're called the United States of America for one thing, okay? And so we need to unite, and how do we solve problems? And how do we, do we get a greater sense of reality? I can only get a limited sense myself standing here, okay? I can't see what's behind me. You folks can see what's behind me. Together we can see more of what's going on in this room, okay? But we each have our own perspective, so we're all connected with a community college. Um, and so we're gonna look at it from that perspective. So maybe we need some people from different perspectives to get a clearer picture. And the more perspectives we have, and the more ways we have of understanding the situation, the deeper and more comprehensive our understanding can be. So we need to connect with others. And I believe that that's a part of our nature. Is, is to connect, and, and people who report the most life satisfaction are people who have meaningful relationships over a long period of time. Um, that's what we're, I think, um, geared to do. That's, what, that's uh, a natural part of who we are. And in doing counseling, and particularly around relationship issues, it's simply a matter of removing the obstacles to that. And the nature then is to want to connect. That's something that we all want to do. So if something's divisive, turn it off, look away, shut it down, look somewhere else. Ask what you need to know and what you can, what you can do about it. Are they using fear, anger, or blame? Shut it off, turn it over, walk away. That's divisive, okay? That's the, the, those are things that people use to manipulate us, okay? There are very real concerns in the world. There are dangers, okay? They're not immediately in this moment. Any danger that's not immediately in this moment, better than fear is to go with caution and concern. 
Okay? We can have caution and concern and still have our mind be open and deal with it in, in, a, in a way that we're thinking through and that we're looking at the large picture and the implications and the history and we can get a good sense of that. Um, but if we're coming from a place of fear, anger, and blame, uh, we're not going to do that. Okay? Um, curiosity is a part of our, our natural self, I think. All children come into this world curious, and, and, and some of us maintain it, but I think we can all get it back. And we all have interest in things. And so if an article presents it from that perspective, it's very different than blame and isolate. And of course, compassion. Uh, and sadly, that's not something we see in the news very much. Okay? Um, someone like who has, who's showing compassion for the people who commit the terrorist act. But that would go a long way to helping us solve the problem if we understand where they're coming from and what their needs are. And, and if we're able to meet those needs in another way, um, then they don't have to go there. And that was basically uh, uh, the key to dealing with you know, dozens and dozens of people who had problems with violence throughout my career, maybe hundreds. Um, learn to meet your needs in a way that works for you, not in a way that doesn't work. We all have the same essential human needs, uh, and if we're aware that, that we share those needs uh, and can recognize them in each other, then we can look at how those needs are being met. And if someone doesn't appear to have the resources to meet them in a healthy way, we need to figure out how they can have access to those resources. And that will solve the problems long term, rather than, than just short term quick solutions, which is the conceptual part and what our brain comes up with when we're in fear-based thinking. We look at things in terms of, of short term, and, and so to the extent someone is absolutely certain this is the way it is, raise a thousand questions in your head. Uh, dead end labels and statements. Uh, those are categories that we put uh, people and issues in that simply stop us from thinking and asking questions. Okay, so uh, liberal is one. If you call someone a liberal, there are people who just, okay, I know where you're at. I, I had a discussion with someone once and said, oh, you're a liberal, and she didn't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> okay, like, well, not really, because I, I look at it, you know, there's, there's, it's much more complicated for that for all of us to the extent that we're asking questions and, and looking at things. So those categories and, and you know, everything about uh, uh, racism and, and, and problems with that, they're dead-end categories. Uh, you just put someone in a category based on their race or nationality or where they were born, and you stop asking questions, you stop getting to know them. And the solution to that is getting to know people. And uh, there's three uh, beautiful stories, I won't tell them all, but, but I'll give you an overview uh, of three people. One is a, a white supremacist. Uh, uh, he was a, uh, as a 13 year old, he gave a lecture at the white nationalist movement against uh, President Obama back in, I think it was 2010 or 2009 when he was first elected. Um, he, he had his life totally turned around when he went to college because there was a, uh, a Jewish, he had been shunned by the other people in his college because they knew who he was. He had his own radio broadcast for his whole teenage years about promoting white suprem supremacy. His grandfather was David Duke. Um, but this Jewish man uh, invited him, another student, invited him over for Jewish Seder dinner. And here he is, a white supremacist who's against Jews, but he didn't have any friends, and the guy kept inviting him. And so finally he went and figured, at least I'll get a free dinner out of it. And they didn't accuse him or blame him or judge him. They just had a dinner and they played some games afterwards. Um, and he came again the next week, and they had a dinner and played some games after work a week. And after a few months when they, they were knowing each other, then they started asking him, you know, questioning his belief, and he took some courses that, that gave that a deeper foundation. And he wound up writing a letter to the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, revoking his past, saying, I was wrong, I made a mistake. And his father, who was really high in the white supremacist movement, called him up and said, you've been hacked. And he said, I haven't been hacked, I've had my eyes opened. And there are two other uh, examples. So one is a, uh, a young woman who, as a six-year-old, uh, was pictured wearing a sign, Death to Gays, and who traveled around the country with her parents and grandparents protesting all kinds of things. And, and, and very uh, divisive and judgmental. And the other was a, a Ku Klux Klan imperial wizard who had his life totally turned upside down by a, a black preacher who refused to, to judge him and just kept on reaching out to him and treating him with dignity and respect. 
and over a period, not minutes or days, but years, actually he became a preacher in a black congregation. He did a total 100 degree, degree turnaround coming out of that dignity and respect and that, that sense that we all have a need to be um, connected. And so anything that's demissive or judgmental of other people in terms of, of looking at relationships or adversarial pushes us apart. And so that's information that we don't need. Even if a good part of it is factual, if the overall effect is to push us apart, it's not useful taking us in a direction that's not healthy. Um, so instead, we need to be able to look from other perspectives, recognize that every living being is worthy of some respect. And to the extent that we recognize that, we make all of our lives easier. Right? And we make it easier for other people to recognize that too, to the extent that we treat them with dignity and respect. Okay, so narrowing it down, what is one tool that I would leave you with? I always try to get things to their simplest form. So the simple question to ask when discerning news, I would say is, is it divisive? Okay, uh, the two questions about media literacy and what is true are balance and ask questions. Okay, thinking about one thing that you could do on a daily basis that would help you discern what is true um, there was an obvious answer to that because it's something I've been doing for 45 years every day, okay? And that's meditation. And here's what meditation does, okay? We start with a natural rhythmic breathing, okay? We'll practice this for a couple minutes, we've got some time. Okay, you start with a natural rhythmic breathing and you'll simply repeat a sound to yourself as you're breathing, okay? Silently to yourself. And we're gonna use a sound from yoga. Uh, I use it in the course I teach. Uh, it's so as you breathe in, and hum as you breathe out. And those terms translated from Sanskrit simply mean this and that. Okay, so this and that. The sound seems to make a difference. I've had people who've been trained in other forms of meditation that are newer. This one's been around 2,500 years, and for some reason, it's easier for people to stay with that. Okay, but here's what happens. You're paying attention to your breath and the sound, and you're gonna get distracted. It might take three seconds, it might take three minutes, it doesn't matter how long you're distracted or whatever, you just let it go. Oh, I'm being distracted. Don't judge it, no, stop that. Just let it go and you come back. You might get distracted two seconds later. That's okay, you let it go. When you realize it, you come back. You get distracted again, you let it go, you come back. You get distracted again, you let it go, you come back. You get distracted again, you let it go, you come back. Distractions are part of meditation. Sometimes people say, I can't meditate because I'm too distracted. That's like saying I can't swim because there's too much water. Distractions are what you're dealing with, okay? But think about that. Every time you let go and come back, you're creating a pathway in your brain. And every time you repeat it, you're strengthening that pathway in your brain. Where you let go of where it's being pulled, and there are people who are highly skilled at pulling our brains where they want them to go and creating pathways that are beneficial to their interests but not to ours, okay? So our brains are being pulled all the time, okay? But when you learn to let go of that pull and to choose where you're focused, now you're free, okay? And it's that simple process, even if you do five minutes every day. If you do it once a week, it's probably not gonna be very helpful. It really is most helpful on a regular basis. And I think of it like brushing my teeth. I mean, I would not come here today without brushing my teeth, and I wouldn't come here today without meditating. Uh, it just, I just notice a difference in my thinking uh, when I've meditated. I mean, it's just clear, okay? Um, and so, uh, simple process. Why don't we stand up, do a little balance, because you've been sitting, and it's almost the end of the day, okay? Do a little grounding, okay? Check your feet. You want your feet basically pointing straight ahead, okay? Um, so you're anatomically neutral, okay? And your pelvis is actually back a little bit. It's not forward because now my, my lower back is starting to work if I do that. And let's just shake and bounce because we can't hold on to tension while we're shaking and we can't tense up when we're bouncing down. And stretch your face a little bit. Ah, <sighs> let out a sigh. Okay, yeah, just get a little stretch. Okay, and let's just try five minutes. Okay, so have a seat, sit comfortable, 
It helps if your back is, is straight and supported. Helps to sit in the back of the chair. I can't demonstrate that here. Um, but, but basically, if I'm like this, my muscles are having to work. If my pelvis is uh, down my sit bones, now my spine is supported, so that's a little bit better. Okay. And uh, I'll just talk you through the process. There's a little introductory exercise that helps you to kind of ease into it a little bit. But just um, allow your eyes to close and just watch your breath for a moment. Just feel it coming in and coming out. And get a sense of how far down it's coming into your lungs and into your pushing down in the diaphragm and, and into your abdomen. And each time you breathe in, let it be a little bit deeper and each time you breathe out, just let yourself relax a little bit more. And just let the air come out on its own when you exhale. And try to let the inhale be natural as you can without working at it. Your body just does this without thinking. And this is our natural way of breathing. To the extent that we're under stress or tension, we lose track of it and, and the breathing will change, but it's something can be restored with practice. Again, it's forming pathways in your brain and loosening up uh, the system in your body to allow that to happen naturally again. And just allow that to continue. Each time you breathe in, let it be a little bit deeper. Each time you breathe out, let yourself relax a little bit more. And now shift your focus to the tip of your nose, the inside of your nose. You're going to notice the breath is cool as you breathe in and warm as you breathe out. Having that physical sensation makes it easier to, to uh, take the next step. Cool on the inhale, warm on the exhale. And now as you breathe in, just silently say the sound so. And as you breathe out, you silently say hum. So on the inhale, hum on the exhale. If you're distracted by sounds or thoughts or anything at all, don't uh, worry about it. It's not a problem. Just gradually let it go. Don't push it away or force it. Just let it pass. It's run its course. And gently return your focus to your breathing. So on the inhale, hum on the exhale. So on the inhale, hum on the exhale. And then to end the meditation, just put your hands over your face, open your eyes, and slowly bring your hands down. That gives you a transition back into the light so it's not uh, abrupt. And I'll leave you with this thought. What can you do to promote media literacy and respect for truth? Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it.